Leslie. I'm here tonight with Dr. Robert Nee, and he's going to share with us his music and tell us a little bit about his life and how he came to be where he is now. What do you do for a living? Well, I basically practice medicine. I'm a radiation oncologist, and I've been doing that for about 30 years. I treat cancer patients. So what got you interested in composing music? It's a fairly different field. It's a different field, but it's a, it's a very creative field. Um, I have uh, always had the ability to compose and write music. Um, even when I was a little boy, I always had tunes and melodies that came into my head whenever there was a, a, such a situation uh, that came about, and I usually expressed it with uh, music as well as lyrics at the same time. And I can remember even back in the early 1960s, mid-1960s, there was a song that I had written uh, called There's a Bandist in the World, and that was when uh, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated, and it just came spontaneously. And that's the way a lot of my music comes. If there's some events, either external or within my own uh, uh, life, uh, I will have the uh, urge to, uh, to write. It's, so you started when you were young? How when I was young. I've, I've had the ability, yes. I've always had that ability. Yes. And what would you like to do at this point? At this point? I'd like to get up and dance and be on stage and perform. I want to be a rock star. But seriously, <laughs> what I would like to do is I've, uh, I've just come out with a CD of my own compositions. Uh, I do not perform on, the, on, on, on this particular uh, album, though. The role of music that I, I've written and I've hired uh, professionals actually to perform. And I would like the music to get out there and for people to listen to it and basically to enjoy it. And uh, I'd like to continue writing as long as I'm able to. It's what I love to do and it's a, it's a creative outlet that I've always had and I'm exploring it uh, every day more and more. Can you tell me a little bit about the CD? Does it have a specific, um, like a tone to it? Is it it's, well, the title is called Talk To Me. Uh, some of the songs deal about relationships, uh, man and woman, uh, difficulty communicating, some of it do with feelings, personal feelings. Uh, one of the songs I wrote called It's Just Too Difficult deals with uh, uh, somebody having the, uh, not being able to express themselves all that well. Uh, the person happens to be me and that, ca that stemmed from an argument that I had with, uh, with somebody and it came out in, in words and, uh, and with music. Um, I wrote a song that was inspired by one of my patients who survived a, a uh, very serious form of cancer. Uh, we had gone to a, um, a party. Uh, I thought it was going to be like a dinner party, actually. It turned out to be about 150, 170 people extravaganza for a 50th uh, uh, birthday. And uh, she called me her guardian angel, and uh, she beat the odds, basically. And I was so touched that when I came home, I just went to the piano and I spontaneously wrote out the song. It's called Manu's Dream. And it's about that young woman who overcome a uh, serious illness. Something always happens when I fall in love. It's not what I'd imagine, not what I'm dreaming of. Something came and struck me, and now I'm unwound. Dreams turned into nightmares, life's turned upside down, and someday, sometimes I feel happy. magic just passed by my way. He is my guardian angel. Chase my nightmares away. 
So you, when you say that composing and playing is kind of a therapeutic um, For me, it's, uh, it's, what they, it's what I would call an emotional anodyne. It's, I find it extremely relaxing. Uh, one of the first things I do when I come home, uh, after I pet the dog, is I go right to the piano. And uh, I've been doing that as long as I can remember. Uh, we've had this uh, large piano here, this grand piano, for a number of years. But before then, we had a, uh, an upright piano. And we've had keyboards before we could afford a, uh, an upright piano. I've always played music whether it's the piano, uh, the recorder, uh, the guitar, you name it. And I also sing as well, and it's always been a tremendous uh, gratifying outlet for me. It's an integral part of my, my life. It can be very relaxing, it, it, it really is. And often I'll, I'll close my eyes and I'll be in a, in a transcendental state. I'll be somewhere else, I'm transported. And that's what I like about uh, playing music and being able to compose and, and write your own music it's a way of expressing your inner feelings. Because I tend to be, um, how should I say, somewhat reserved at times. But with music, I could sort of let it all hang out. Do you work with anybody else to compose um, the music? Yes. I work with, uh, with a few people. One of them is, uh, is my composition teacher, Dr. Ken Lample. I've been with him for a good number of years. And uh, we, go, we go over uh, all of the music that I've written. He'll make some suggestions, uh, corrections if necessary, and uh, I owe a, a, gret of, uh, a debt of gratitude uh, to Ken for really pushing me and getting my music uh, out there. I don't think that I would have uh, done it without him, uh, and he's also responsible for helping me get the, uh, the CD uh, um, recorded and produced. Uh, and I also have my, my wife to thank, because even though I write many lyrics uh, with, with my uh, songs, uh, for the most part, she basically uh, takes what I've written and she discards them and she writes good lyrics. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> but some of the lyrics I have written myself, but she touches them up a little bit, but she won't take credit for some of the songs because they're pr pretty much what, I, what I've written. And we work together and uh, we've, been, we've been writing music for a very long time together, both myself and my wife. It's just too difficult. All right, um, there is a story behind this. You know, sometimes you have to be punched in the stomach and all of a sudden something beautiful comes out of it. And this was, uh, this stemmed out of an altercation I had with somebody. And the result really was a, a song uh, dealing with uh, my uh, ability or inability to express myself. And uh, it's called, it's just too difficult. I didn't practice this before, so you'll have to You'll have to bear with me. <laughs> this is on the CD. Uh... Sometimes I wonder if I'm ever going to live in peace. For there's a that needs to be released Sometimes I wonder If I'm ever gonna speak my mind Instead of copping out Like I've done every time But it's just too difficult Too difficult to say and perhaps the words will come again on some other day But it's just too difficult, too difficult to say And perhaps the words will come again on some other day But it's now or never, come on, go take a stand I may not live another day and get a second chance Am I really dreaming? Is the path so hard to find? Or have I had a breakdown and I've really lost my mind? Um, would you say that you were influenced by anybody specific or a, a genre? Um, an artist, 
I would say that um, the influences have been varied throughout my life. Certainly growing up in the 60s and early 70s and having an older sister who grew up in the 60s and the, the late 50s, I was influenced, of course, by, uh, by the uh, rock and roll and a lot of popular artists of the day. Uh, I've always had a fondness for some of the uh, uh, musicians and composers from the Broadway stage, George Gershwin, Jerome Kern, um, uh, and certainly Richard Rodgers, uh, Stephen Sondheim are some of my favorite uh, composers. Um, my favorite song, one of them anyway, is Over the Rainbow by Harold Arlen. Uh, but I like all, all, uh, all music, as long as it's good. Classical music, of course, a lot of the Mozart and Bach, very romantic pieces, Chopin. Um, I like the current stuff as well, uh, to be very honest with you. And I like my stuff also. <laughs> um, and I'm influenced by the sounds and, and you know, what I see around me as well. I think I absorb a lot of that. Um, and I try to integrate it and come out with a, uh, with a voice that's, that's mine, that, that's sort of unique. Um, I don't know what else, how I can answer that. I, th I think anybody who writes music is always influenced by, by the people who've preceded them, also your contemporaries. And since I've really, I don't play that much in groups, I've performed in chamber orchestras and I sing in choir, but uh, it's not like I'm a, a playing musician, I, uh, so I don't have all the, the feedback with other musicians like that. Uh, but nevertheless, I still hear a lot, and I see a lot, and I, and I feel a lot, and I think that's what's important for any composer. Most importantly, where can we find your CD, and when are you going to be on Carnegie Hall? Um, well, it's about time you asked me that question. I was waiting for it. Uh, you can visit my website, if you so desire, at robertnee.com, R-O-B-E-R-T-K-N-E-E. -E. Um, and my CD is available from the website. It's also available for download on iTunes. And uh, regarding Carnegie Hall, I'm checking my email regularly, and, but I'm not standing by the telephone and waiting for the call. Hi, I'm Mitra Lundy, owner of Kinetics Personal Training and Group Fitness. I am here at 409 Raritan Avenue in Highland Park, New Jersey, and I love it. Um, if you want to be healthy, if you want uh, physical health, uh, spiritual health, mental health, like it's all right here, it's available. And the people here really appreciate uh, the idea of health and wellness. Um, it's also, um, the downtown is like the place to be. Um, everybody likes and appreciates being able to walk uh, to, the, um, to the stores that they, uh, that they um, support. Um, and um, people really appreciate local businesses. Um, so those are like really three great reasons to, to come to Highland Park. This was a great idea. Um, me being across the street from the post office and Wells Fargo Bank makes me like an ideal uh, uh, location. Um, so it was, it, it was the best thing I could have ever done. Um, we usually work with a few kinds of clients, either people who are really looking to be motivated by, our, uh, by a trainer or it's the individual who's had issues with their knees or, they bat, or their back and they really want guidance on how to do exercises safely um, or it's the individual who really just likes one-on-one -on -one training and they don't like a group setting so they come to us so we can give them a really good, a really good workout. We do suspended classes like a suspended yoga where you kind of sit in this thing like looks like a hammock and uh -huh. you do all sorts of yoga poses and we have a class called TRX um, and it bases, basically uses a strapping system in order to get a, uh, a really good workout so you can work multiple muscle groups at one time always using core muscles so it's like uh, you get more bang for your buck. Boot camps are a cardiovascular and uh, strength training uh, 
program really they use uh, body weight also in, uh, in um, free weights to get a great workout um, and it's usually themed so they might have something that's like um, hardcore workout which is all about strengthening your core or they might have something um, you know the ultimate thin thighs and uh, the workout will be all about strengthening your legs and creating uh, a toned uh, a toned look in your thighs so uh, strength training cardiovascular training if you want quick results um, you want your want to see your body change in 28 days that's the class that you would take and what kind of dance classes do you offer? Sure, we um, currently offer uh, Zumba probably five days a week, which is um, Latin dance based. So mm -hmm. we do salsa, we do merengue, hip hop, um, really whatever the instructor kind of feels inspired by. It's usually 80% Latin based. Uh, we have, uh, we're getting ready to offer a modern dance class, which was like by request. We had a lot of clients like, oh, can you offer modern dance? Uh, we have a hip hop class starting and uh, we offer a class called ballet tone. Um, ballet tone is a uh, uh, ballet based class but it's for the non-dancer so we use ballet as the basis for uh, a cardiovascular work. How did you decide you wanted to go into fitness and training and stuff like that? So if I am honest about uh, how I got here, um, it started way before I even realized it. Uh, I can remember being really young, um, like 10 years old, and I was, I really sucked at sports, but I really liked aerobic exercise and I liked the idea of being healthy. So I'd be up at, at like five o'clock in the morning and I'd be the only one uh, up in my house before school and I'd be exercising with Gaylon Janklowitz and Denise Austin. And at that time they were like really uh, well-known fitness gurus. Yeah. Um, and my mother would say like, why are you up? And I'm like, I have to exercise before I go to school. So it really started there, but I became a dancer. So I joined a traditional West African dance company and I worked for Rutgers for about nine years. And um, one day when I was at Rutgers, one of the uh, directors asked me if I would teach an, a West African dance class. And I said yes, and that was really the beginning of my journey into kind of uh, health and fitness um, professionally. Yeah, it's been great. It's uh, probably the best thing I could have ever done. author of Images of America, Highland Park, and Derek Hertwig of Highland Park's Historical Society, who will give us a tour of the history behind our town that is known as Highland Park. Well, Highland Park, uh, as, as a borough, was formed in 1905, but obviously uh, people have lived in Highland Park for uh, uh, many centuries. Basically, the town of Highland Park has been around since 1905, although there were many other residences and farms and big estate houses that were constructed long before 1905. history because I started to do restoration on old houses and I was very interested in learning more about them. The, there's uh, up until the late 1600s there wasn't uh, any way that anybody can get across this section of uh, the Raritan. So John Inion, a very enterprising individual, purchased land on this side close to where we stand right here and on the other side which is now known as New Brunswick and uh, created a ferry service and he used to charge people to uh, cross the river. 
So he had a boat, a, a boat that he used to transport people across. And that was in existence until the late 1700s, so almost uh, for 100 years, there's a ferry service that transported people across here. It wasn't until the late 1700s that uh, the first bridge was constructed here. It no longer is in existence, but uh, that, that uh, in, I think it was maybe 1792, was constructed, and that was the first bridge across here. So. Uh, this area of Highland Park is very important because uh, it was a transportation route for people going from New York down to Trenton and perhaps on to Washington. Gene Colva, author of Images of America, Highland Park, and collector of Highland Park's archives, came down to HPTV studio one evening to talk to us about our town's history using her collection of historical maps. This is a map from 1766. And it shows uh, very schematic uh, drawings of houses in New Brunswick and a few of the roadways. But it also indicates the ferry. And on the Highland Park side, which is over here, the ferry house, a barn, and doc Dr. Mercer's mill, which was also uh, an inn. The Albany Street Bridge is in existence today, and it's hard to imagine it, that this did not, uh, that there wasn't a bridge at, at that any time for transportation. That's the Iron Trust Bridge that was constructed in 1878, and it came down when the construction of the taller Stone Arch Bridge uh, took place. There was a campaign to get rid of the level crossings through cities and so New Brunswick um, had to raise its railroad tracks as it cut through the town. So that meant raising the river crossing the bridge, raising uh, the railroad tracks uh, all along its route, which is why the current railroad is very high up compared to the land to the landscape in which it traverses. Here, they kept the trains running on the old bridge while they were building one half of the Stone Arch Bridge um, next to the rails. Then when the first half of the Stone Arch Bridge was finished, then they began to construct the second half while the trains ran along the new, along the top of the new Stone Arch Bridge. Unfortunately, it was covered with concrete during World War II so that most of the structure that we see today is covered with concrete. This is a photograph of the, the church being constructed. You can see the high school tower in the background, and you can see the workers uh, laying out the uh, foundation. You can see the old uh, cars here. This is in the early 1900s and uh, I don't know the exact date, but uh, you can see how they're working here. It's a church that has been in existence for uh, nearly a hundred years, and uh, the significance of the, the building itself is that it still stands, and we have uh, evidence of what it looked like prior to uh, its, being constru it, its construction, and we have uh, photographs of it actually being constructed, so it gives us a good sense of the type of work that uh, was involved. It looks different than what it did in uh, when it was originally constructed. I'll show you a picture of it as it stood in uh, the late 1800s. Uh, this is this is the the building uh, in uh, this may even be uh, 1900. Uh, but if you look at the structure, it looks much different than what it did uh, when it was originally constructed. Well, the Livingstons owned it up until the late 1800s, and then it was sold to a family, and then it was passed on until the Waldron family, which is, has uh, a lot of significant, significance in Highland Park here. The Waldron family owned a, a manufacturing plant that constructed the machinery that manufactured wallpaper. 
and uh, was the largest Waldron Manufacturing Company was the largest manufacturing company to construct wallpaper making machinery. And they actually had their plant just across uh, Cleveland and over uh, in what is now known as the industrial section of Highland Park. And that at one time was large manufacturing plants and uh, the Waldron family uh, had their, their business there and lived in this house. So it's been passed on to families and then uh, the Waldrons actually owned it until the late 1900s or uh, yeah 1999 I believe it was in which at that time it was sold. Uh, the last Waldron sister uh, died and uh, it was sold and the Weinberg family purchased it in, uh, and lives in it now. The importance of this whole area that surrounds the Waldron house is that at one time it was a 150 acre farm and up until the early 1900s, there is virtually few, uh, very few houses that existed in this area. Uh, early, late 1800s, uh, there was a man called Watson Wittesley, who was a developer, who had lived up in East Orange and chose to purchase this area and to develop it, which was a, an important uh, uh, thing for, uh, it's an important development in land development. Uh, it's a change that happened uh, in the early 1900s in which somebody would actually purchase a property and then would uh, build houses on speculation to sell to people. Uh, prior to that, most people would purchase a, a section of land and then would hire somebody to build a house. So uh, the importance of this area, which is called the Livingston Manor Historic Area, and we're uh, hoping that it would be listed on the national and state registers of uh, historic places is that uh, this whole area was developed uh, uh, under Watson Wittesley in the early 1900s. This is a good place to start to talk about the history of the area and it uh, uh, talks about uh, the original settlers here and the Native Americans. The first map uh, drawn in um, 1682 and uh, you can see the Raritan River, this is the area that Highland Park and New Brunswick share. And you see the roads. Um, this side is uh, the New Brunswick side of the river, and this is the Piscataway town, uh, Piscataway town side of the river. And you can see the river crossing the Indians Ferry, which was established in uh, 1675. One of the significances of this street right here in front of uh, the high school, and this road in particular, is we can look at uh, one of the original trails uh, that used to go through this area. The Aspink Trail was Native American trail that led uh, from the ocean and led all the way over to the Delaware. And if you, if you ever look at this road, uh, you might wonder why it's on such an angle, all right? Whereas most of the other streets are, are uh, at 90 degrees to each other. Now if you look at a, a, an old map dating back to the 1800s, I believe this map is in 1888. It, uh, it shows you as you're going down Woodbridge and then uh, a road that's called uh, Mill Road that cuts across what was in Highland Park and leads over toward the Raritan River near River Road. Highland Park has been a borough since 1905. It was in March and the residents who lived in the area wanted to have more control over the, their affairs. Uh, the tax money that they were paying to Raritan Township was becoming a burden and they were feeling that there was not enough return services uh, to the town so they decided to form their own government and elected their own mayor and had their first borough council and uh, and started governing themselves. So here you have on North 2nd, uh, number 8, North 2nd is what's known as the Dash Electronics and you have the uh, Beam Sturfer uh, Gallery beside it. And at one time the second floor was actually the Borough Hall it was used as Borough Hall for a period of time. We're looking at what is now known as the Cleanland Cleaners, and this was the original uh, building in which the volunteer fire department in Highland Park 
uh, used to store their machinery. Up until the mid 20th century it was used as the fire hall and has changed quite a bit since then but if you look at the old photographs you can see that still much of the original structure uh, can still be seen in the old photograph. Now we're starting to stand on the corner of North, Fourth, and Raritan, and some of these houses here were some of the original residences on Raritan. You can see the additions that were made to them. In the Stern, the Stein Building here, constructed in 1925, is a fine example of some of the construction that was done in the 1920s during a very uh, big boom in construction in Highland Park. It's a fine example of uh, brick commercial building on Raritan Avenue. It wasn't until the early part of the 20th century that Highland Park really started to increase in population. Automobiles and the existence of trolleys coming into Highland Park from New Brunswick allowed more people to come and live in Highland Park, work in New Brunswick and trans, you know, and, and move from here to different places. So automobiles were becoming much more popular. We just looked at the old garage that stands just a few doors down from here. And this street, as it exists today, looked much, much different in the 1920s. Uh, trolley lines used to be in here. And uh, since then, it's changed, obviously, quite a bit. At that time, it was still a residential street, and now it's much more commercial. Whenever we study history, a lot of it usually has to do with where we live. Even as Highland Park changes over the years, it will still keep evidence of its legendary past. No matter where one walks, history will always surround them. I'm John Turner. Thanks for watching.